uh, we're going to get a little practical here. So the first panel I thought was really interesting and illuminating, and I could tell by the questions that that was a view shared by everybody. Uh, we're going to delve a little deeper, get a little practical. We're going to talk about security, and we're going to talk about great power competition and how uh, various players in the region see it. Uh, on the, the question of great power competition, um, I can't believe we're finally talking about it. It seems to me that we are uh, a day late and a dollar short, as they say. Uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, President Clinton sending a large U.S. fleet into the Straits of Taiwan in 1995 in reaction to Chinese war games in that region, uh, where they were obviously expressing uh, great power ambition. Uh, and pushing for great power status. And uh, all that's happening in Europe now, and everybody wants to talk about great power competition in Europe, it's pretty clear in 2008, uh, when Russia invaded Georgia, uh, that we were in that period already. And so it's great that we're gonna talk about great power competition and how people see it. It, it really is past time to do that. We've assembled a great panel for us to, to go through this today. Uh, I'll just briefly tell you about who's on the panel. So on the screen, Coming to us from Rhode Island is uh, Dr. Michael Peterson, who's the director of Russia, Russian Maritime Studies Institute at the U.S. Naval War College in Rhode Island. Uh, he'll be talking about the state of the Russian Federation Navy in the Pacific and its cooperation with the plan. Then we'll have uh, Dr. Malhotra here on my right, who's the editor of the chief, uh, editor-in-chief of the Canadian Army Journal. And she'll talk to us about the interests and perspectives of middle powers uh, from India to Southeast Asia on security issues in the region. Uh, and then we'll have Commodore Peter Levy, who is the Chief of Staff of the uh, Australian Joint Operational Command. Uh, he'll present on Australia's policies and experiences in navigating great power competition between China and the United States. Uh, so it promises to be a great, uh, a great discussion. Uh, just like the last panel, we'll have 15 minutes uh, per speaker, folks. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Peterson, whether you'll be able to see the, uh, the card, but I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, at 12 minutes, there's a yellow card come up. At 14, there's a red card. I don't know what happens if we go past 15, so, so don't let it happen. Uh, and then we'll get on to some questions. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Peterson, please. So thank you very, very, very much for that. And good morning, everyone. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you out there in Victoria. I have to say, this is a conference that uh, I really do appreciate. Um, I think it's, it, it's a tremendous learning opportunity for me in a city that I love, and I apologize that I can't be there in person. So hopefully I can keep you reasonably entertained and provide you with some interesting information um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a repayment for uh, my absence there. So. Uh, what, if you give me a moment here, I will just share my screen with you. There we are. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing this now. Um, so the title of this talk is a takeoff on a couple of different things here. Um, we, uh, uh, just prior to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Putin went out to Beijing where he visited Xi Jinping and walked out of that, um, that meeting declaring that Russia and China have a friendship without limits. Now, uh, so that's, that's part of it. Now, the second part of it is that uh, we know, if you study international relations, we know that states don't actually have friendships, they have interests. Um, so this is the second part of it. And the third part of it is uh, that tremendous business mantra of uh, the, the fictional American paper company Dunder Mifflin uh, in, the, in the American um, uh, sitcom series, The Office. And that business mantra, that plan is limitless paper and a paperless world. So hope, I, think, uh, I think probably um, President Putin's declaration makes about as much sense as that uh, coming out of that, coming out of that, uh, that meeting with Xi Jinping. So what I want to do is I want to talk about um, how the Ukraine war has opened up um, opportunities and challenges on both sides for both Russia and China, and how that has kind of altered um, this uh, strategic partnership that they have tried to, um, to develop over the, over the last several years. Um, I'm not uh, optimistic that there are a lot of options uh, for uh, us here in the West to sort of um, help drive wedges between them, but maybe we can get into that a little bit, especially in the Q&A. 
So uh, moving forward here, first question is, what does Russia want? What does Russia uh, sort of traditionally wanted as a, as a sort of grand strategy? Well, Russia believes that it is a great power and deserves to be treated as such. Uh, so what do they want? They want to be ubiquitous and they want to be indispensable in, in the global security environment. So um, what does that mean? Uh, they know that they don't exert the same sort of gravitational pull as the United States or as, as China, but they want to be involved in the major questions, um, uh, security issues and economics issues um, around the world. They believe that they um, have earned the right to sit at the table. After all, it was the Soviet Union, for example, who won, who won World War II, not uh, the Western allies, but the Soviet Union uh, won the war, and they've got their receipts to prove it. So um, one thing I want to caution you against, though, is uh, that uh, establishment of a uh, pro-Russian bloc of a uh, nation similar to the Cold War, so this new establishment of, a, of say, a Warsaw Pact-like bloc, is not a goal for Russia, right? They're not out to rebuild the Russian Empire or the Soviet Empire. They know that they're limited in that sense. So what they're trying to do is um, sort of establish this multipolar world rather than a bipolar world in which there is a, a lot of fluidity and that Russia has a hand in all the events that, um, that take place in it. And, and finally, uh, one last point that I want to make is that um, I have been thinking about this a lot since the start of the Ukraine war. And I used to believe that um, Russia was seeking acceptance of a sphere of influence in Eurasia. But I think what the Ukraine war is showing us that Russia is actually um, seeking a sphere of dominance in Eurasia, um, especially in security and political and economic issues. And I think um, it's pretty clear we can see how that's going to uh, sort of butt up against, uh, against uh, Chinese interests. So, um, Let's baseline this a little bit. Um, what does no limits friendship mean? Well, um, first of all, um, Russia, is, China is, is Russia's largest trading partner. Um, and that's only becoming more true um, in the wake of the Ukraine war. Um, this is uh, um, a photo of uh, Vladivostok here on the, on, the, on the right side of the screen. And um, I think it's a sort of interesting sort of uh, metaphor for what's happening in the Russian Far East. Vladivostok is the most important port, uh, uh, port facility um, on Russia's Pacific coast. It is the hub of many new trade routes that are springing up uh, in the maritime domain between Russia and China and, and, and Russia and the Indo-Pacific region in general. And, um, and overall, we see a, a, a dramatic increase in trade between China and Russia in the, uh, in the wake of the start of, of the war in Ukraine. Um, as this audience knows, Russia is also a critical source of energy and raw materials in China. This is just one sort of small list of examples um, of the ways in which that's true. But China, by design, has had an extremely diverse um, import market. Call it the sort of um, import portfolio with lots of different sources of all the things it needs um, in order to um, continue its economic growth. Um, that doesn't change the fact that Russia is a key player in that portfolio, but China's portfolio is quite diverse. It's not based uh, on um, any single country. Um, that way they can sort of avoid those um, dislocations um, in ways that countries like, say, Germany have not been able to avoid in their, in their heavy dependence on Russia. So, um, of course, this audience also knows that a that China and Russia have embarked on um, a series, long-standing series of military drills that are becoming more sort of um, complex and more diverse in their uh, goals and meaning uh, over the last many years. Um, these um, exercises and drills have been aimed at improving. Um, both forces capabilities aimed at improving interoperability, uh, encouraging defense industrial collaboration, um, sending signals to partners, um, and promoting mutual assurance and confidence building. Um, I think that, that they have become a really important tool for the institutionalization of Sino-Russian um, defense ties, especially um, uh, because we know that Russia and China really have no interest in signing a formal defense pact, have a formal alliance. But these exercises are really important for institutionalizing their ability to, to interact with each other. But there are challenges in this relationship. Um, there are stressors that exist and that the Ukraine war has um, exacerbated. 
China already regards Russia as uh, being on a sort of permanent and kind of unstoppable decline um, towards marginaliz marginalization, right? And sort of um, lacking the relevance that a, a, a nation that considers itself a great power should have. Um, this is largely because uh, of China's assessment of Russia's um, demographics and economics. And we can have a conversation about whether or not um, demographics are determinative of a country's fate. I'm not so sure they are, uh, but we can maybe talk about that in the Q&A um, a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, Russia's historical identity um, sort of um, um, resists this idea that Russia is a nation in decline. Um, and that's a really critical thing here, right? So China believes that Russia is a nation in decline. Russia resists that characterization here. Um, and this is sort of an interesting photo to show that, right? These are um, Soviet um, veterans and, and World War II veterans from a photo taken several years ago. Um, they're obviously very, very, very old. And Russia is a very old, demographically speaking, a very old country. Um, and yet, it's an illustration of the Russian belief that the Soviet Union won World War II and therefore is a great power and that status is irrevocable. Uh, and that's really important to sort of understand from the Russian point of view. So um, there is this there is this problem in place, but there's also this interesting what I think uh, what I would characterize as a sort of um, complex codependency. And in, in which China needs Russia to be a powerful state, not just a vast China needs Russia to be independent and powerful in order to showcase it as um, what is within the art of the possible um, in a China-led um, world order, right? This strong, independent Russia is um, a, a powerful part of a China-led global order and able to resist um, challenges from the US and the EU. So there's that codependency that they, China needs Russia to be strong, but also understands that Russia um, may be on the path toward demographic uh, decline. So what does that mean with, uh, in terms of, of, of the Ukraine war? Well, um, there are a number of factors that kind of fall into place here on this. Um, so notwithstanding Beijing's protestations of neutrality, um, um, it has essentially fallen in line with um, the Kremlin's narrative, right? Um, this is a special military operation, not a war. Um, it has accused the West of provoking Russia. It has um, sort of ignored its um, sort of global geo, its, its uh, sort of grand strategic vision of um, territorial integrity and sovereignty around the world uh, as Russia has invaded another country, right? Um, so, and it's of course ignored abundant evidence of Russian war crimes. Um, so they've sort of aligned themselves with Russia, but they're being very careful to do so uh, because they're worried about being tainted by association with an internet, which what is essentially an international delinquent. Um, and that is sort of what's in the process of happening here. Russia's actions have also squeezed uh, Beijing on Taiwan. Um, they have um, had knock-on effects in the global economy, um, which also hurts uh, Chinese interests. And it turns out that China's best friend is, is both barbaric and um, could be construed as, as, as largely um, inept. Uh, so this, this country that they have gone in with uh, turns out to be not such a great, not such a great, not such a great bargain after all. So now it's up to China to figure out how to handle that. Well, one of the things that I would suggest um, Russia is facing now is a Chinese opportunity. And that is uh, an opportunity for China to leverage more out of Russia uh, in, uh, in return for its uh, broader political support in Ukraine. Russia is a pariah state. We all know this now. Um, but China, and China is under pressure because of this. So the cost of uh, supporting Russia is um, being is is being associated with a pariah state and being um, uh, at risk of um, broader Western sanctions. So um, they're really concerned about those sanctions. They're concerned about being about coming about their image as a pariah, potential pariah. And so, um, in exchange for this kind of no limits friendship, they have an opportunity here to leverage greater benefits um, from Russia. Remember, states have interests, not friends. So what are the what are some examples of what that might look like? Well, um, here's one, right? China is already leveraging Russia for discounted energy and other commodities, but it's also likely to be seeking uh, greater access to um, high end Russian technology. And here are just some ways in which that may be true. Um, now, um, 
Russian the Russian government has been trying to um, constrain um, these transactional channels between um, Russian companies and Chinese companies um, since the 1990s uh, or since the late 1990s when um, um, Russia sort of began sort of climbing out of this um, terrible economic hole they were in in the in the 90s. Um, and uh, so that's sort of that path is sort of um, sort of actively constrained. Uh, but that, that hasn't stopped the PRC from uh, conducting other measures, like trying to ex exfiltrate um, uh, um, data uh, via cyber attacks. And we have evidence that they have done so in things uh, with regard to things like submarine technology, which I'll get to here in just a moment. But one of the things that Beijing really covets is um, Russia's Arctic expertise. And I think that's maybe of particular interest, um, of course, to folks in Canada. China has not yet learned the lessons of operations in the high north. Um, it aspires to be there uh, for uh, comp competitive purposes and to protect its economic interests, uh, its economic trade interests, especially as it sends more trade uh, via the northern sea route and other, and other uh, trade routes in the high north. Um, and it wants to develop a partnership with Russia, one that facilitates uh, technology transfer. And if Russia and the United States are going to be operating in the Arctic, um, or any other nation for that matter, um, then China wants to operate there too, if for no other purpose than for the uh, sort of broader peer recognition that, uh, that, 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 that would come with that. But China still lacks a lot of that sort of um, um, important, valuable experience that Russia has. So this is an area that Russia, uh, that China views, I think, as uh, sort of um, fertile ground for Russia. But there are limits to Russian patience. Russia considers itself a great power, so um, it's not going to let China do whatever it wants, especially in the Arctic, where Russia's um, maritime doctrine, just published, new one, just published in 2022, indicates that um, the Arctic is a vital area that um, Russia will uh, fight for, that it will literally go to conflict for. Um, so um, what, are, what are some of these limits? Well, um, Russia has blocked Chinese vessels from conducting surveys uh, in the Northern Sea Route. Um, and has arrested uh, uh, Chinese uh, Russian officials um, for spying for China. Um, and on the basis of recent trends, it kind of appears that Russian distrust um, will kind of modulate this cooperation in the Arctic. We'll have to see sort of where that goes and whether or not um, uh, China leverages this um, uh, uh, in the wake of the Ukraine war. So there are other stressors as well, right? So what you see here on this slide is essentially an inherently weak position, right? Um, China is Russia's biggest market and Russia needs Chinese cash. Russia has a massive sovereign wealth fund, but they're really wary about tapping into that um, because, um, because of, the, of the sort of broader economic implications it has for that country. Um, so this is, this is really an inherently weak position. And, and I think that um, Beijing is going to exploit this um, position very quietly while under the banner of this sort of uh, friendship without limits, this limitless friendship. Um, they're going to exploit that um, while um, Gazprom is delivering gas, for example, um, at half the price um, it was delivering gas to the EU last year. So China is really forcing Russia to sell gas gas and oil at cut rate prices. And Russia really has no choice but to go to them and to accept those rates because it needs the cash. Um, so Beijing is really trying to push this as, as, as hard and as fast as they can. So um, China is likely to uh, continue this uh, sort of portfolio approach. Um, again, Russia needs China, but China does not necessarily, narrowly, does not necessarily need, excuse me, need Russia um, uh, to the same sort of level. Now, Russia is a key energy supplier, a key supplier of raw materials. I don't want to downplay that. Um, they're critical to China. But the Chinese, on the other hand, um, aren't, do not quite um, ascribe uh, the same value, at least right now, that Russia might, might ascribe to the relationship. So again, um, China has, watched, um, has also watched Russia try to leverage energy um, over the EU for the removal of sanctions. So it's also wary about becoming too dependent on Russia uh, for any of its needs. Um, it will allow Russia to be a major partner, but will um, uh, try to avoid becoming dependent, uh, too dependent on Russia. 
I want to mention submarine technology as well, um, because obviously this is an audience that knows that Russian submarine um, quieting technology um, is, is, except for the United States, peerless in the world. Chinese uh, nuclear submarine submarines are not. That has to do with the fact that um, Chinese uh, nuclear power plants are of an earlier generation, comparatively much, much louder than uh, Russian uh, new generation Russian submarine power plants. The Chinese want that technology. They want it badly. Uh, but the Russians will almost certainly resist that. Um, so that's, some, that's, that's an area to watch if, uh, if the Russians begin um, sort of making allowances um, for Chinese access to that technology. Um, that's a sure sign that Russia is in a, in a, in a pretty bad way. So um, this is the last piece here. What could China, what, what, could, what could derail these sort of um, deeper, uh, this, this deeper security alignment? Well, right now, um, uh, shared opposition to the United States is what's kind of driving these two countries together. Uh, but I do think that there are ways that this could get upset. Um, these two nations fundamentally have different sort of world views of what the of what the sort of global security and security environment should look like, what it should, what the global order should be. Beijing sees the world in very hierarchical terms, which is with itself on top, um, and they and they need stability in order to maintain that, to maintain the trend that it's been on over the last uh, decade or two. Um, they need that stability, but Russia believes that it also belongs. Uh, at the table with these great powers, and that no single country should dictate um, global affairs, right? So it believes in a more multipolar environment. The problem here is that Russia's relative economic and military weakness can cause Moscow to lash out, right? To um, engage in high-risk geopolitical actions like the war in Ukraine, like energy shutdowns, like initiating a global food crisis. Um, and these things are um, inimical, at least at this point, to Chinese interests. And this breeds instability in that relationship. Um, and so it's not necessarily uh, the kind of thing that China wants to see um, in a China-led uh, global world order. Um, I don't see a lot of ways in which the West can affect that right now, particularly um, in the Ukraine war. The, the United States, for example, cannot be seen to be encouraging Russian economic development um, against Chinese interests right now. It's not sort of politically viable, nor I think is it a good idea in general, given, um, given the state of that conflict. Um, so uh, there are lots of different ways that this is, this is a challenge. There are some, possibly some opportunities there, but they've really been shut down by the Ukraine war. And I think what I'll do now is I'll stop here. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I will turn off screen sharing. Uh, just bear with me for one moment while I do that and uh, turn, turn it over back over to the panel. Thanks again. Much for a, a tour de force uh, in just over 15 minutes of uh, a very complex relationship that will, uh, that will really uh, uh, be great for the question and answer period a little later. Right now we'll turn over to Dr. Malhotra who will uh, take us through the, uh, she's gonna go up to the, the stand there and she'll take us through uh, how middle powers from India to Southeast Asia see great power competition in the region. A very good morning to everyone, and it's great to be in Victoria. And thank you so much for the, to the organizers for the invitation. And before I begin, like just a disclaimer, all the views that I express are my personal views. It's got nothing to do with the Canadian Army or the Canadian government in general. So bottom line up front, I would be speaking about three points. The first would be what has really changed with the turn of the millennial. Right, A lot has changed in the last 22 years, and that's what I would focus on. And the second would be, how is India, as one of the major powers in the region, trying to navigate this change? And the third would be how Southeast Asian countries are trying to navigate the change that's been happening and still ongoing. So let's go back to the end of the Cold War. Like, of course, I can go back even before, but stick to the end of the Cold War. So since the end of the Cold War, right, we've seen even during uh, the World Wars, it was the US in the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific back then, which was the dominant provider of regional security and also a dominant economic actor. So all the regional countries were kind of, you know, economically integrated with the US and also benefiting from the security that the US provided the region. Now, this is not to say that the regional actors were perfect or very happy with the unipolar world order, but despite their divergences and despite their concerns, they were quite you know, happy with the mix that they are getting security. It's easy to free ride with US as the dominant actor. 
and uh, just things just went. But what changed with time was how the US after the end of the Cold War kind of started, uh, you know, I would call it the benign neglect. So it's not that the US became a non-dominant security actor. It was still the principal provider of uh, public goods in the region. But at the same time, we see Canada, you know, sorry, China rising. And you see China's economic prowess kind of attracting the regional actors. And you see greater integration with time. 1997 Asian financial crisis is when everyone realized that, okay, you cannot just always rely on the West to kind of, you know, do your bidding in the economic sphere. And uh, China actually, you know, rose to the occasion. And a lot of countries which kind of had the sense of distrust with China, you know, or gi given their territorial disputes with China, were quite happy to see China play, you know, a much more cooperative economic role. And again, you know, everything was going well until the 2008 financial crisis hit. And what, did, what this did was kind of, you know, highlight the fact that the international liberal economic order wasn't as strong as it looked before the crisis. And at the same time, China, you know, did not get affected by this financial crisis as much as many other countries did. But what also happened is while it, you know, the, while China was the economic actor, it became a much bigger security concern. It's not that the security concerns did not exist before, they of course did. But after 2008, China actually kind of gave up, you know, its uh, uh, bide, bide my time and, you know, hide strategy. So it became much more open about, you know, its assertiveness. And it actually felt that, oh, finally my time has arrived. And now when this was happening, the US did not have the kind of resources, you know, to give a surety to the regional actors, which it did back then during the Cold War or, you know, during the World War II period. So if you look at it, even though the US wants to be there, it did not have the resources. And there's a rising debt problem. And at the same time, US also realizes that it cannot just rely on its allies, you know, to help it. It also needs partners. And many of those partners do not have overlapping security conceptions. There are a lot of differences in how these regional actors look at security vis-a-vis -vis how Washington looks at it. So for the US, of course, things became complex. They could not do a lot of things unilaterally, which could be possible before because they didn't have the resources. And for the middle powers and the secondary actors in the region, it was so much complexity because they wanted to balance their economic interests along with their security interests. And it was you know, becoming more and more difficult because the lines were blurring. And even then, they kind of maintained that. And then there was this, you know, navigation between what can be called the great power competition. Even though every secondary actor or the middle actor in the region had their very subjective national security interests and had a very subjective way of looking at the region. So after 2008, 2010, the region becomes more imbalanced, security concerns are rising, and you see greater US-China competition and after 2014, you see Russia's re-emergence kind of, you know, become a bigger thing. So now these regional actors are not just balancing between the US and China, but balancing between US, China, and Russia. So it's three actors. And, you know, like was covered in the previous presentation, even Russia and China do not see, you know, eye to eye on all the aspects. There are areas of divergences and there are areas of convergences. So now I'll we'll focus on how India looks at all this change and how the Southeast Asian countries do. And if I'm going past the time, just feel free. So India uh, is an interesting case because throughout the Cold War, India did a very good job in hindsight, balancing between US and Russia, uh, sorry, Soviet Union. And the bigger thing was that Soviet Union did not come across as a threat to India, and it did not want to invest its resources, you know, kind of funding a military alliance when it realized that it really did not need to be a part of any. And that is when India kind of followed what we know as the non-alignment movement, when it did not want to be aligned with any of the sides and wanted to carve its own path. And after the Cold War finished, India realized, okay, the biggest partner that India had during the Cold War, the Soviet Union, was no longer around. And what did it need? It needed to diversify its relationships in a manner that India benefits from all the sides. And that is when 
New Delhi started what's known as the multi-alignment policy. So the idea was to not stay non-aligned, but kind of align with a number of major actors in a manner that it actually serves all of India's diverse, you know, security, economic, and political interests. And that's what we've seen over time, that India has you know, been embracing a lot of major powers together. And sometimes these major powers are at odd with each other. Like not all these major powers agree with each other. And India has been trying to balance that you know, dichotomy and trying to maintain the duality between what can appear as contradictory interests, but again, with different actors. Which is why we see that you know, after China's emergence as a security actor became a problem for India because it's mostly, I think, at the end of the 2000s, sorry, I mean, you know, after 2005, that India started realizing there was greater cognizance that, yes, China is a bigger and a much more long-term threat to India as opposed to any other country, which is why we see that India and the US and US allies start working much more together on a lot of aspects, including in the Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, while India is also an Indo-Pacific actor, part of a Quad, part of the you know, Japan, US, India initiative, it's also a part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's also a part of the Russia, India, China cooperation uh, arrangements. So again, as I said, there are dichotomies which India has been trying to balance. Now, the bigger problem is that India's dependence on what was once the Soviet Union and now is Russia is biggest when it comes to military preparedness. And even as India is kind of struggling with China and diversifying its you know, arms, weapons, procurement uh, arrangements, it also notices it needs Russia because without Russia, India does not have the upgrades, India does not have the continuity in a lot of its platforms because the Indian armed forces are almost 70% dependent on Soviet or Russian supplies. And things have become much more difficult after the Russian reinvasion of Ukraine recently because these contradictions have sharpened. And India realizes that after the war, Russia may not be the strongest and the most reliable arms supplier because it needs to focus on its own weaknesses and its own rearmament. And at the same time, India also realizes it cannot get a lot of technologies that it did from Russia. It cannot get those technologies from the Western world. So again, as I said, you know, there are things where, where in India wants to have the best of both worlds, wants to play on the fence and have its security interests, economic and political interests, all of them taken care of. Now the problem is, is this sustainable? So what India is doing is kind of continuing the trends that it followed before the cold, you know, during the Cold War. Because what it did was kind of benefit from the US on some aspects, benefit from Russia. But now the problem is between US and China competition, China is also a security threat to India. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was not a security threat to India. So even though it seems like a lot of people believe that this is good, you can continue to play those fine lines and contradictions, but is it sustainable in the long term? Because at the end of the day, you are dealing with one actor, which is your security threat. So this is exactly how it's going when it comes to South Asia or the Indo-Pacific Indian Ocean region. Things are a bit different on the other side. When we look at Southeast Asian countries, there have been a lot of secondary actors which have clubbed together, you know, in different forums, trying to negotiate better with great powers. Now, every time you have one country kind of, you know, getting closer to the US, most of the scholars and uh, analysts believe that, oh, you know, Vietnam is counterbalancing China or uh, Indonesia is counterbalancing China, which is actually a wrong way to look at it. Because what these countries are doing they do not want to balance one country against another. They kind of want what is, what is best described as omni-enmeshment, wherein they can have all these major powers in the world be integrated into the security of the region, wherein all the major powers are actually balancing each other so that these small actors or secondary actors do not have to do that bidding. Because if you have just one actor dominant in the region, that is not going to be favorable for the region. And of course, you know, it's important to be aware that all these secondary actors have very specific and you know, subjective views. There's hardly any consensus on any of the topics. 
groups, but they do believe that they need all the major powers to check each other so that one actor does not become the dominant threat to any of them. And what they're doing is actually creating equilibrium so that there's room for autonomy and there's greater room for them to maneuver in these settings. Now, of course, you know, the biggest problem is when you have these binaries of, okay, with us or, you know, against us, that's not gonna work in a region like Southeast Asia because A, none of these small actors can ensure their own security. They would always have to rely on a bunch of other actors which kind of, you know, take care of the region. But at the same time, they do not want to become a victim of, you know, the strategic competition because they want to have their interests taken care of as well. So I think one of the ideas, you know, one thing that I see kind of going wrong in the whole discussion, especially in Washington, is that it's not about, you know, telling your partners or, you know, potential partners in Southeast Asia that you're important to us only because you feature in our strategic calculations. The question should be, what is it that, you know, you want? What is that you can offer? And based on that, if you have a strategy wherein you're not just looking at what Washington wants or you know, what the other Western countries want, it's about what these actors can offer and those nuances need to be maintained. Because if those are not maintained, it's so difficult to have everyone on board. And without that, having a long-term strategy is not really going to work. My last two points would be, what can be done better? Now, the thing is, there's been this hyper focus on forms, right? Forms in terms of partnerships, forms in terms of alliances. And what is actually going wrong is that there's not much focus on the functions of these forms. Let me give you an example. We have Quad, right? Quad did not start out as a grouping. It actually started out because it was a collection of countries trying to actually address the problems that they faced in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And that's when all these countries realized, oh, as for democracies, we have so much resources which could be combined together to actually fulfill a mission, which they did really nicely. And so it was a function which made it successful. And now when they you know, made a form out of it, they expect all the countries to be kind of in alignment with each other on the conception of security, which may not always be working. So you'll always have these areas of convergences and you'll always have these areas of divergences but if you can kind of build on those convergences and kind of build on through mission-based you know, arrangements as opposed to form-based arrangements, I think that may be the right way to go. I'll stop here because I know I'm crossing, but we can discuss more during the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malhotra. That's a, a brilliant uh walk through a really complicated region and a complicated scenario and I know the audience will have a bunch of questions as they try to understand from you um, what what happens when when we try to balance uh, when those countries try to balance great powers against each other you know the, the risk that might also be involved in that that balance that might not work out as balanced as we hope uh, with, with that uh, let's turn to Australia where uh, Commodore Levy will give us a really good understanding of, a, of how a middle power that is enmeshed in this uh, region uh, sees Oh, thanks, Admiral. It's great to be here. Can I add my thanks to Admiral Topshi and the conference organisers as well for putting on such a great event. Uh, this is the third MSC that I've been to in person. Uh, they've always been great, and this one's shaping up to be no different. Uh, just following on from our theme of middle powers uh, and building on the previous presentations, my aim this morning is just to provide an Australian perspective of how we're navigating the contemporary environment. Uh, I'll cover off what a medium power is, what that means for our national interests and security, and then outline a few aspects that I think are relevant to the Australian case. I am standing up here in uniform, uh, but I will caveat that what I present are my own personal views, uh, not necessarily those uh, of the Australian Navy, uh, our Department of Defence, or my government. Um, so how do we find what a medium, uh, sorry, a middle power is, a medium power? Richard Hill, in his great book in 1986, defined three levels of, uh, of national uh, power. At the top, we have superpowers, those with the global ability to influence events to suit their own needs. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, we have small powers. Uh, they don't have any uh, really substantial ability to uh, act independently. And then the most difficult to define in the middle, uh, medium powers, they sit between the two. Uh, the crossover of these categories, of course, will always be subjective, uh, but Hill defined, and I agree with this, uh, medium powers as those that can protect their vital interests against everything but a superpower. Uh, that begs the next question, of course. 
what are a nation's or a medium power's vital interests. Um, I'd argue all nations have two common vital interests, uh, territorial integrity and their political independence, and I'll add up there the prosperity of our nations as a given as well. Uh, but in addition, there may be other country-specific interests that each individual nation deems to be vital. For Australia, I'd argue that our sea lines of communication and therefore our ability to trade are vital. They are what we really do need to protect those. Over 99% of our trade by volume travels by ship, uh, and this perspective of the globe shows you why. Uh, we also have a large and growing dependency on undersea cables. I think every country in the world does these days. So for Australia, the seas really are our lifeline, even if most Australians don't fully appreciate it. Uh, I would add another vital interest, uh, and I think this one's relevant for most medium powers, uh, and that's upholding uh, some form of rules-based global order uh, that avoids the might is right approach. Uh, I take Alina's point earlier that, uh, that this system, the rules do need to evolve over time, uh, but I think we do need a broadly accepted international system to facilitate interactions. A hundred years ago, Mahan and Corbett wrote, uh, they wrote of great powers with global reach uh, that acted independently. We had British ships carrying British cargo, manned by British sailors and protected by the Royal Navy. The current global order is very different. It's very globalised and the maritime uh, domain is now a truly international enterprise and I don't need to expand on that here. So I think contemporary medium powers do need a rules-based global order that's stable, consistent and predictable. That gives them the maximum opportunity to pursue their interests and the things that mean the most to them within a fairly narrow window of options that's largely set by the great powers. And then when Hill uh, wrote his book in 1980, uh, wrote his book, sorry, in the 1980s, uh, I don't think there's terribly much that's changed uh, in the desired outcomes, but what has changed are the circumstances in which we seek to prosecute those aims uh, and the tools to do so. Uh, I won't harp on this, but of course, the global strategic centre of gravity is rapidly shifting from Europe to uh, Asia, and the Indo-Pacific is undergoing the most uh, significant period of strategic realignment since World War II. Great power strategic competitions driving this, uh, and although high intensity warfare in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific region uh, is not imminent, uh, it's arguably more conceivable today than at any time since 1939. Indeed, our previous Prime Minister, when he launched a defence strategic update in 2020, commented that the international situation was reminiscent of the 1930s. Uh, and Kerry touched on this in her presentation in the previous session, uh, but I think there is truth in the adage that history may not repeat, but it certainly does rhyme. Now, much has been said of China's economic rise, and it's certainly been impressive. Uh, hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty uh, is a truly great achievement. Uh, and China has been one of the largest, if not the largest, beneficiary of the current global order. Uh, that said, I think it's also clear that the West's policy or hope uh, of engaging China economically and therefore opening them up politically or seeing them open up politically uh, has not worked. And it's also clear China is actively seeking to reshape the global order. As the recent 20th Party Congress showed, the leadership of the CCP, I think, is becoming more nationalistic and more confident in their place in the world. And that's reflected in their Navy, which has grown significantly. And now we must acknowledge, of course, that the Chinese Navy has every right to sail and operate in accordance with international law and pursue Chinese uh, interests. That's what all nations do. Uh, but the PLA Navy has grown in both quality and quantity significantly. And we're seeing them deploy uh, more at greater distances from home and at times uh, with greater assertiveness. Uh, the other big change since Hill's book uh, is technology. In 1986, precision guided weapons and satellite communications were in their infancy. The public internet didn't really exist and social media, and importantly, the, pro uh, the profound impact it would have on the way people absorb information were still years into the future. Uh, today, we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, which is evolving at an exponential rather than a linear pace. It's impacting every aspect of life and every industry. We have the Internet of Things, AI, robotics, autonomy, uh, 3D printing, nanotechnology, quantum computing, to name just a few of the most spoken about. It really is having a profound impact. For navies, the impact of technology, I think, means that uh, naval warfare has now gone from being akin to poker, where you don't really know what cards your opponent holds, to more like chess, where, you, where the location of everybody's pieces is known, and the, risk is to, uh, sorry, the, uh, the trick is to discern intentions. Aligned with this in the naval context is the uh, complexity and expense of modern warships. 
No longer can anyone be like Germany during the Second World War, when at the height of it they were producing two U-boats a week. Ships lost today to combat will not be replaced for years because of their complexity, even if we had the industrial capacity to do so. So I think navies will need to be very sure of victory before com commencing any kinetic or weapons exchanges. Uh, that means the threshold for naval combat today is likely much higher, but once that threshold is met, action will be rapid, bloody and costly. Uh, the final point is uh, soon after the uh, Cold War ended, Geoffrey Till, who spoke at this conference in 2018, uh, articulated his concept of postmodern navies. Uh, he argued that postmodern navies were those focused not on independently pursuing national interests in isolation, but working with other navies to promote international maritime stability and security. In a sense, working together for the collective security of all. Really, and that's an essential prerequisite for the full benefits of globalisation globalization to be realised. In many ways, we are acting, I think, as Till predicted, but have been able to do so because the overall maritime security framework has been underpinned by the United States uh, and, and it's not been seriously challenged. The 9-11 attacks saw about a 20-year period where we all focused on power projection from the sea as there was no need to have to fight at sea. Sea and air control were a given, so the Western allies, uh, me, including medium powers, were free to exploit that sea and air control to make the most of the efficiencies offered by globalisation. But we can't think like that anymore. Circumstances have rapidly changed over the last decade, as I've just described. So while navies still may act in a postmodern fashion, cooperating for the greater good, I'm a realist at heart and think that that behaviour now is driven more by states seeing that as the best way to pursue their national goals and less as altruistic behaviour, setting the uh, benign conditions for everybody. And we see that in the greater number of security arrangements and partnerships that are being formed these days. In short, I think of, uh, of Till's postmodern, oh, sorry, I, I think of our collective naval and modern endeavours less through Till's altruistic, if you like, postmodern construct, and more in terms of alliance management to suit national interests. So I'll turn now to Australia specifically. Australia's first formal articulation of the divergence of our national interests. Uh, and, uh, and China's strategic ambitions was in our 2009 Defence White Paper. And by 2016, when this paper was released, uh, we saw a shift in priority and a greater uh, focus on activities closer to home. We also saw a significant increase in defence spending. And it was around this time that our Navy started reducing our effort in the Middle East and refocusing back in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, for me, it was a bit of back to the future because that's where I spent most of my junior officer time. Uh, we released a strategic update in 2020, at, which highlighted that the trends identified in 2016 had now accelerated quicker than expected. Uh, this update provided uh, for $275 billion over the next decade for new defence capabilities, and notably was an increase in, of $75 billion over the amount committed just four years earlier in the white paper. And I think it's telling that this increase was, in, was announced in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic when our, our federal budget was under, as most were, was under uh, fairly significant and unexpected pressure. And just this year, our government's commissioned uh, another defence strategic review, recognising that things are evolving even faster than they were in 2020. And this review is being led by a former defence minister and a former chief of defence force. And will, uh, we expect, amongst other things, look to reprioritise our investment plans and our timelines. So our current strategic policy is best summed up by the, uh, the three words there, shape, deter, respond. Uh, what we seek is to use the full dimensions of the, uh, the dime, the diplomatic information, military and economic levers that we have to shape the strategic environment and deter actions against our interests. We'd really like to remain in the shape and deter phase of our strategy uh, because they're the elements in play in strategic competition. We want to avoid having to go to the respond part because that implies, of course, that we've moved from competition to conflict. Having said that, the ability to deter, of course, is based in large part on your credibility in being able to respond. Now, for medium powers, deterrence is not about the threat of destruction of an opposing force, uh, particularly if that force is stronger. Instead, what we need to focus on um, is making the expected costs to an adversary uh, significant enough that they may think or rethink uh, their plans that they might have to take action against us and draw the conclusion that the benefits of military action do not outweigh the costs. It's all about managing risks. The essence for that, and particularly for a medium power, uh, is on alliances. 
Australia has a very strong uh, history of working within alliances, first led by Britain and since World War II, uh, by, largely by the United States. The ANZUS Alliance has underpinned Australia's security since the early 1950s, uh, and although it's much less proscriptive than other more formal arrangements such as NATO, it does mean it's been uh, very, or it is very adaptive and it's evolved significantly uh, over the last 70 or so years. We also have the Five Eyes in, uh, Intelligence Sharing Agreement that evolved from World War II, which is the cornerstone of our shared switch, uh, situational understanding. And we have uh, other agreements such as the Five Power Defence Arrangements involving the UK, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Singapore and Malaysia, uh, which is originally established back in the early 1970s. That's coming back into prominence now, particularly as the UK increased their focus on the Indo-Pacific. We also have a number of agreements with regional countries uh, and, and are quite active in a number of ASEAN fora as well uh, around, our, uh, around our local region and those regional partnerships are really, really important. More recently, of course, we've seen the re reinvigoration of the Quad, which you just heard about, between Australia, Japan, India and the United States. Uh, and of course, in September last year, we saw the announcement of AUKUS, uh, an enhanced trilateral security partnership between Australia, the UK and the United States. Uh, and I should point out that while nuclear submarines got all the media attention around that announcement, um, there's much more to AUKUS with enhanced collaboration across uh, cyber, AI, quantum technologies, undersea capabilities, hypersonics and the like. It's quite an all-encompassing arrangement. Uh, in addition to alliance frameworks, of course, and in many ways supporting them, medium powers really need to focus uh, as well on areas where they bring a unique benefit to an alliance. We can't be free lighters, so, uh, so alliance members must identify what strengths they need to, or what they can bring to an alliance and really capitalise on those. In Australia, one of our strengths is our geography, uh, both in location and size. We have a lot of area for training uh, and we're seeing increasing partners come down, Singapore and the United States being just two, to make use of our vast training assets, which is great. Uh, another aspect uh, for alliances uh, that, that medium powers can bring to alliances is local knowledge. Uh, one example, and I'll shout out New Zealand here, or even more culturally enmeshed in the Pacific, uh, but is our Pacific Island region, which has seen a lot of strategic competition being played out. Uh, under the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, the Pacific Island nations, like, like us all, got uh, vast areas of exclusive economic zone, uh, and Australia donated patrol boats to many of those countries, along with some technical uh, and operational expertise to help build their capacity to protect their EEZs. Uh, so that's one area where I think Australia and New Zealand, more so as I said, have got, uh, have got a great strength. I should highlight of course though, um, and particularly in relation to the Pacific Islands, uh, that they don't see uh, great power competition as their greatest security threat, this was touched on earlier, they see climate change, again something we need to understand. The other factor we've taken is to move away, uh, back in the 1960s, we moved away in Australia from primarily British equipment, more to United States equipment. And we've got a lot of commonality across particularly air and naval platforms with the United States, uh, and not just the platforms, the weapon systems and, uh, and sensors as well. Uh, and finally, medium powers need to decide what capabilities they would like to keep as sovereign and what price they're prepared to pay to do so. One of the downsides of globalisation is that it prioritises efficiency over effectiveness, and this again was touched on earlier. When the geostrategic environment's stable, that's okay. You can afford uh, to have fragile supply lines and perhaps lose some organic uh, expertise in industries that are now uh, carried out overseas. But when, this, when the environment's not stable, that becomes a challenge, and you risk finding out that you're not as effective as you might like to have been, and COVID forced that on all of us to a certain extent. Australia has historically been a big importer of defence uh, equipment and capabilities, uh, but that's something we're trying to change, at least to an extent. Uh, and that's most notable in our national shipbuilding enterprise. We have a history of boom and bust cycles in shipbuilding, which has been quite expensive and difficult to maintain. But a number of years ago, we embarked on a continuous shipbuilding program across three broad lines, major surface combatants, submarines and minor war vessels. Now, some estimates place the, uh, the cost premium of building warships in Australia at around 30% compared to just buying them from overseas where labour costs are cheaper. But that price has been judged as worth paying for sustaining the industrial capacity to repair, modify and upgrade ships and of course the flow on economic benefits that accrue. That's the price that we've decided is worth paying to increase our effectiveness over just efficiency. 
So in conclusion, how do uh, medium powers best protect their interests in the spaces in between, as the title of uh, this panel was? Uh, I think first by clearly understanding what interests they see as vital and recognising that they can't do all they would like and so have to make choices. National strategy is all about marrying up uh, unlimited desires with limited resources and while major powers can do most of what they would like and small powers don't have a great deal of agency to do very much at all, it's medium powers that really have to make some tough decisions. Uh, they need to protect the global rules-based order as the best way of collect to collectively pursue their interests as we can't afford to go it alone. And we all also need allies and we need to bring, uh, bring value to the alliance partners that we have. And we need to consciously decide what cost premiums we need or we are willing to pay to keep capabilities and skills within our own uh, sovereign control uh, and keep them domestically. And finally, of course, they need to participate in key conferences like this one to keep our dialogue open and keep the exchanges of ideas flowing, which is great. So can I again just thank the organisers for the opportunity to share a few thoughts and look forward to any questions you might have during the panel discussion. Thank you. That, I think that uh, is an impressive uh, talk. It, it, um, it's a serious strategy from a serious country that faces serious challenges like, like the rest of us. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the defense and security business would, would appreciate that. Uh, we're going to jump right into questions. Folks, we've got a little over a half an hour now before we uh, break for lunch. And so um, if you got your hand up, uh, someone will bring you a microphone in a second and we'll jump right into questions. Please remember it's question and answer period, not long speech period. Thank you, uh, Stan Weeks, Washington. My question regards your comment uh, from Commodore Levy, uh, which I don't necessarily disagree with at all, that in the concept of uh, naval combat, it's liable to be short, bloody, and costly, the actual combat. But as we're seeing in Ukraine, and maybe possible in other contexts in the Pacific, what do we do, what are the considerations and maybe how they differ in middle powers in dealing with the problem of a possible longer protracted conflict and the impact and the requirements on the industrial base? Um, and, and how do, should that prioritize compared with uh, the money put into a fight tonight force and readiness? Uh, yep, it is, yep. Uh, look, thanks, Dan. Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, it was effectively about the uh, balance of resources into the fight tonight versus more longer term planning. And of course, the 30% cost premium I mentioned to build warships in Australia does come at a cost premium. That's the very definition of it. Um, but I think for medium powers, uh, and my comment on being short, sharp, and, uh, and bloody, I think is based largely on, um, uh, on the speed of engagements these days uh, and uh, and I hope it came out, the, the recognition that should we take damage, it's going to take a long time to replace those capabilities. So that's why I think the threshold for everybody, probably you know, including the United States, the threshold for to go to combat operations I think will be quite high. Um, so that's going to be a, a challenge. The, the medium powers, I mean, we've got a, an extra um, challenge in that one of the things we need to factor in is the actions and policies of our superpower friends as well. Um, so we've got to be very mindful of what the United States does. One of the things I, I, I pointed out about bringing value to an alliance, one way to bring detriment to an alliance very quickly would be to draw your other alliance partners into a conflict unnecessarily. Uh, and the challenge I think we face as medium powers, particularly in the maritime environment in doing that, um, is the grey zone, so-called grey zone tactics that we see a lot and salami slicing around areas like the South China Sea which are very hard to counter with traditional military capabilities. Um, so that's going to be a real challenge. Um, I, look, I, and, and to answer your question on the balance of resources, I think uh, that's up for, for governments to make that decision, but I think uh, keeping uh, a sufficient level of industrial organic capability to maintain, um, to maintain your military forces, not just naval forces, yeah, that, I think that's really important, recognising that it does come at a cost of the fight tonight. Um, but it all, oh, yeah, that all hinges on preparedness, I guess, and, and they're risk decisions that governments have to, have to make. So um, it probably it's not a really satisfactory answer of, of, to your question, but I think 
we just got to constantly look at what's the risk we're facing, um, uh, how do we best address that risk, and what's our risk appetite, which will change over time as well. So I think it's just a constant moving feast for all, for all countries, but particularly for medium powers. Yeah, Dr. Malhotra, do you have a view of, of how other countries in the region might see that? I guess, like, regardless of if a power is a middle power or a secondary power, I guess all the governments are kind of, you know, dealing with this predicament as to, because the threats are not sometimes just maritime threats, a lot of countries are facing, like, land-based threats, maritime. So it's not just about, you know, resource uh, allocation based on short-term wars or long-term wars, but also in terms of the different domains that they're dealing with. And I think one of the ways you could kind of deal with it is, of course, something which I see lacking in almost all countries is a combined arms approach. I think that's one thing we've noticed in the ongoing war that Russia is doing like really bad because there is no combined arms approach. So I guess if at the planning stage and the, at the strategic level, if there's greater integration of different approaches, which comes at a much more you know, effective way to deal with things, I think it would be better and easier to allocate resources accordingly. And uh, Dr. Peterson, I see you nodding. Do uh, you have a view of, of how Russia is doing, and uh, particularly in the Russian Federation Navy? Certainly, and thanks for the opportunity to comment on this. I, I agree entirely with uh, what Dr. Malhotra was saying. Uh, I think that, that the, the combined arms approach is probably really valuable. Uh, from the Russian perspective, very, very quickly, um, I have been probably in the minority uh, with regard to the Russian Navy in that I have um, largely believe that the Russian Navy has been operating effectively right up until this weekend when uh, we see, I think, um, I think we need a little bit more confirmation, but we see this very interesting amphibious assault um, into Crimea conducted by, by the Ukrainians. Um, largely speaking from the st sort of strategic level, um, I do think that the Russian Navy had been able to um, uh, conduct its, its uh, effectively conduct its most important strategic missions. Um, that is long range precision strike and uh, blockading Ukraine. Um, this, the, the grain deal lives because the Russian Navy allows it to live. Um, and so uh, if, uh, if the Russian Navy is ordered to shut it down, then they will, would be able to do so effectively um, in a variety of ways, um, at least right now, given the, given the um, sort of seeming appetite for supporting it in, in the international community. But I think that um, you know that assessment, as I said, has been changing quite a, uh, uh, quite rapidly. Um, given that now we're seeing evidence that the Russian Navy is actually unable to stop um, what is essentially uh, a, a small-scale amphibious assault um, in what appear to be rigid hull inflatable boats, um, despite the fact that the Russian Navy is equipped with um, boats that are designed to stop these uh, exact events. So um, I think the the, the record. Um, is mixed and getting worse for the Navy. Thanks. Thank you. Is there another question out there? Musk. My question is for Dr. Peterson. Um, World War II left Russia with a population gap leading to a decline in birth rates, which arguably weakened the USSR and contributed to its fragmentation towards the end of the Cold War. With the mass migration of people leaving Russia because of the war in Ukraine, do you see the potential for further fragmentation of Russia as regions such as Chechnya, the Stans, and Eastern Russia realize that Moscow doesn't have the sufficient might to hold the country together? It's a really great question. Thank you for that. Uh, I, think, I think primarily um, the, the jury is still out on this. And if you ask different people about uh, the fate of uh, Russian, uh, Russia from a demographic perspective, um, uh, that you'll get you'll get lots of different answers. Um, I'll try to, to 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 give my position on this as someone who is not a demographer. Um, by and large, uh, I don't think that demography is predictive of um, of of the future um, because there are too many factors that uh, that 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 can uh, that are at play. And demography, I don't think, is a predictor of war fighting power. Although we're sort of seeing, um, I will admit to be that we're seeing a counter argument um, in Russia right now with regard to this mobilization. Uh, modern war, I, I think, is largely about, um, despite some of the evidence that we've seen in Ukraine, is still largely about um, the ability to conduct effective C2, effective counter ISR and ISR, and effective long range precision strike against critical targets. At least that's the way the Russians look at it. Um, and that, that has been shifting, I, I, I will admit. 
Um, anybody who, by the way, comes down for sure on, on these issues in the midst of this war, I think, um, should be re-examining their priors. Um, now back to the, to, the, to the main question on demographics and whether or not this will accelerate um, another Russian decline. Um, I do think that it is problematic, uh, and I do think that um, it is certainly accelerating brain drain, but not just out uh, to uh, Europe and the West, but also to China. Uh, I also think that that's uh, offset by migration into Russia from, um, from especially from Central Asian states. Um, Russia has um, set up some very um, generous uh, policies with regards with regard to migrants from from Central Asia, and many migrants are going there um, to to um, uh, get college educations, and and they wind up staying in Russia because that's where um, job opportunities are. So um, the answer is uh, to your question is 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 cautiously yes. I think Russia is is in a bit of a bind here, but that's caveated by the fact that I don't think demographics uh, technically is destiny, and that. Uh, um, it, it, that, that sort of de demographic outflow, that sort of um, uh, outflow of people from Russia is also being offset by um, immigration flows coming in from Central Asia. The first two speakers. Uh, first, what do you think about NATO's uh, appeal to uh, Asian nations and the participation of uh, Japan and South Korea in the recent summit? Because actually, it uh, reinforces the partnership between uh, China and Russia when actually we've seen all the signs of discontentment by China over the Russian actions. That's my first question. And the second question is in relation uh, to the situation between India and China on the border where the two nations are still massing a lot of extra troops since the incidents uh, two, two years ago. So would a better relation between Russia and China, which is sort of caused by the fact that we are confronting the two at the same time in a way, uh, would help improve the relations between uh, India and China, which remains very tense? We'd like to go first. Uh, yeah, no, I think he's, uh, so uh, it's either Dr. Peterson or Dr. Malhotra. Rock, paper, scissor. Dr. Malhotra, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll actually deal with your, uh, address your question about the India-China uh, standoff. Uh, so the 2020 India-China standoff is actually an inflection point in uh, India-China relations. Before that, I think there was a greater, uh, I don't know, willingness, I would not say use the word willingness, but greater hope in India that things would get better and India would be able to balance its economic relationship and interdependence with China vis-a-vis -vis its territorial problem with China. But the problem was after 2020, that inflection point kind of made China like the long-term threat for India. And that is how we see the strategy kind of changing and India seems to be less hopeful about something, you know, working out. The whole Russia angle actually complicates things more for India as opposed to make it better. So of course, you know, India was always dependent on Soviet Union or Russia for military preparedness, which was most important against China. But what India is very fearful of is actually Russia falling into, into China's orbit. So the whole Ukraine war is actually really problematic for India because India realizes that it actually brings Russia closer to China and Russia cannot be considered impartial if it really has to kind of broker a deal between India and China, which I do not think practically would ever happen. But even if there is an assumption that it would, it actually makes things worse off for New Delhi because it does not want China, you know, Russia falling into China's orbit. And that's exactly what's been happening no matter what India wants, which is why I feel this whole balancing act will eventually be unsustainable because Russia may not have more to offer to India that it perhaps did before the Ukraine uh, invasion. That's amazing. Uh, Dr. Peterson, uh, you have a view of, of how Russia sees this whole triangle? Yes, thank you. A again, I mean, 
Dr. Malhotra makes a really great point here, and I think it's it's fascinating to think about how India might be able to um, extract concessions from Russia here. The war is a strategic disaster for Russia and has placed the country obviously in a, in a much weaker position than it had been prior to February. Um, so I do think that um, that uh, Russia is also wary of, of falling into the trap of being entirely dependent on China. Um, we all know that Russia historically has has broadly uh, distrusted China and has um, some some real concerns about um, how uh, China perceives it um, going back going back now decades. Now China has been um, rather exploitative of Russia um, in real terms. That is, um, Russia has, for example, been unable to stop Chinese logging companies in Siberia from going in there and clearing out. Um, Chinese resources or Russian resources without without their permission. That's just one example of of some abuses that have taken place um, um, in this in this relationship. So Russia is seeking other partners, and I think India would be a critical one. There was a, a, a I, I, forgive me, I have to ask uh, for a clarification on the first question. It sounded like um, uh, uh, whether or not NATO activities are driving Russia and China into a closer alliance. Do I have that question correct? Yes, actually, it was the last NATO summit, as you remember. Uh, the fact that we uh, invited uh, Japan, South Korea, gave to NATO a much wider dimension, which is actually, as you know, the, the Russian paranoia about NATO uh, acting as a global actor, and that's what Lavrov just said in, in Bali. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, the short answer is, uh, from the Russian perspective, uh, that's absolutely clear. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add to that point. I think it's a really critical one, and I've made the point about um, as uh, I made the point about um, uh, uh, Russia um, being driven into the arms of of China by the United States and NATO. But as a general rule of thumb, I would say that. Uh, you know, Russia views itself as um, as encircled by adversaries, uh, as on its own in the world, and sort of um, that these relationships are contingent and um, are not always are not, and are not permanent. Um, historically, again, sort of t taking the sort of historical angle on this, historically Russia believes that um, it is a uh, a great power uh, that has been subject to. Um, invasions going back centuries, whether that's uh, the Mongol invasion of Kiev and Rus, or the, the Napoleonic invasion of Russia, or um, the invasion of the Soviet Union uh, during World War II, and that and it, it bears the scars of those of those um, invasions, and they have uh, sort of had a fundamental shaping effect on how Russia views the world. So when um, and and so when NATO um, is inviting these other um, uh, potential partners in. Um, that are not in its, in its region from a Russian perspective, that is just more evidence that um, that that uh, um, NATO is out to get Russia, right? That Russia is in fact encircled. Now, um, I don't agree with that. Just to clarify, I don't agree with that. Um, that's um, strategic empathy, not strategic sympathy. Uh, but I do think it's a critical point um, uh, to keep in mind uh, when it comes to developing policy with regard to NATO. Thank you, uh, Captain Alan McKay from the U.S. Coast Guard, where I'm uh, Chief of Operations in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, our AOR, as you know, encompasses the Arctic and, and the Russian Maritime Boundary Line. My question is for Dr. Peterson. You, you mentioned how we have limited options vis-a-vis -vis Russia to look for a wedge between Russia and China. And I, I'm just curious if you think the Arctic, because of their limited patience you mentioned with China up there, is, is really that possibility and, and what those options might look like as China rolls up research vessels that arguably have dual purpose or in, in arguably are not uh, following the rules-based order when they're in the Arctic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I think right now, um, the uh, whether or not a wedge emerges between China and Russia is really up to China and Russia. Um, if China pushes too hard in the Arctic, uh, certainly that will create tremendous problems uh, for Russia and Russia will respond to it. I think that Russia has been very clear about um, maintaining and defending its interests in the Arctic. Um, so again, to the point that they, that they have declared that they will, um, that they will uh, engage in conflict to defend its interests there. Um, right now, it's very difficult for us, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's very difficult to imagine a scenario in which it's politically feasible for uh, the United States government to um, um, 
find ways to actively cooperate um, uh, with Russia in, that also um, work to the detriment of, of, of Chinese interests. Um, there are ways that we can and should be cooperating. Um, I'm not telling you, you uh, anything you don't know. Um, search and rescue is critical in that region. Um, and I think that um, the Russians are, are, are going to be willing to listen um, uh, more than, uh, as much as they have been in the past. Um, Russia is, is desperate to engage um, in, the, in the Arctic Council, which has been put on hold. Um, so they, they are seeking engagement with NATO, but it's really sort of just politically infeasible right now, at least in the United States, for this to happen. And, and, and um, I think that's probably also true in Europe, though not quite with the same sort of um, intensity. So uh, I, I, I'll, I'll end by just saying that um, I do really think that um, where, this, where this relationship goes right now is up to China, um, and that there's very little that the West can do about that. If China pushes too hard, in that sensitive area, then Russia, I, I think, um, uh, uh, will is likely to push back. Uh, hi, Jody Atari Walla from Canadian Defense Review. Uh, my question is for Dr. Malhotra. Um, I greatly appreciate your perspective on India and Southeast Asian countries uh, and the dynamics that they face. I'd like to s flip the switch on you and ask what your perceptions are of those countries' thoughts about Canada. Um, because Canada is noticeably absent from the AUKUS agreement, um, and as Commodore Levy pointed out, it's much more than just submarines. So I'd, li I'd like to kind of get an appreciation for how Asian countries look at Canada. Thank you. That's actually a good question. I wanted to do my postdoc on that, but I didn't get funding. So, <laughs> so uh, I think Canada, like you know, sadly has been missing from the region for really long. Like in the 1990s, we still saw Ottawa kind of you know being a part of track to dialogues and being a part of many similar arrangements. But then that kind of you know funding snapped. Things didn't work out, and now the problem is that okay, I'll just say it bluntly. No one considers. Canada as a reliable security actor at this point of time. Having said that, I personally think that there is a shift which is happening, and we, we're going through it, so you know, it's rather easy to just dismiss it at something you know, tangible, but we're going through it, and I feel that this is the change which should have, of course, come a few years back. But the fact that it's here is kind of encouraging, and I feel one place where Canada can kind of, you know, play to its strengths is kind of using its own ally alliances with the US or other countries to kind of not just communicate to the US as to what the region wants, but also communicate to the region what the alliances can offer. Because there is this sense of distrust when it comes to the US with a lot of these countries given the history. But I think this is where Canada has the strength because it's not always seen as, say, say a neo-colonial power or you know, an actor which is there to kind of exploit everyone. So I think that these are the strengths on which Canada has the potential, and I'm hoping that they continue to play on it. But at the same time, of course, funding is always a problem, right? Like, I'm not, the resources will always be a problem. So it's always about where you allocate those resources. Are you helping these countries largely in terms of traditional military uh, concerns or helping them in terms of non-traditional ones or just soft power you know, actions? So it's always a combination wherein I feel Canada needs to be relevant in all of these and not just one of those. Hey, Commodore Levy, as someone who lives in that region and, and sees us uh, arrive from time to time, you know, how, do, how, how does Australia view Canada's participation and, and action in that region? Oh, look, I think uh, Australia welcomes. There has been an increase in uh, certainly the Royal Canadian Navy's presence down there. Um, yeah, we've, uh, and I think that's something we would welcome. Um, uh, the collective efforts, it gets back to my point before, I guess, about upholding that rules-based order, whatever that happens to look like. But we've got like-minded countries, we've got to work together, um, not to push back on any one particular country, but actually just to up prevent them pushing too far you know, the other way, if you like. So just holding the line. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I always am worried about a little bit is the narrative that, um, you know, a country like China or Russia can play is, oh, this is the United States against us. And actually, that's not what it is. It's actually, you know, it's generally 
uh, a whole range of like-minded countries that are actually are upholding international agreements that they themselves have signed up to and saying, no, yeah, here's where the line is. Um, so anything we can do to, to help undermine any narrative that it might be couched as, oh, it's the US trying to contain you know, my country um, solely, the, the more we can do to undermine that narrative, I think, um, uh, the best, uh, the better. Um, but certainly, you know, Canadian, we've worked with the Canadians, or I've certainly worked with them many times. I think we've been to every RIMPAC. We've had Canadian ships down in Australia, and you know, my understanding is that's increasing. There's, a, there's an increasing focus from uh, particularly the Royal Canadian Navy and the Air Force, for that matter, uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, and that's certainly something you know, we would welcome as, a, as another like-minded country, absolutely. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll ask a, a question for, uh, for all of you. Um, interested we, in the previous um, presentation, we talked an awful lot about, uh, about decoupling. Um, and, and, um, but we've talked about it in a really generic sort of level. Uh, and I think with the, uh, the most recent um, announcement by the, the Biden administration about, about how they would try to decouple specifically in, in certain technologies, um, I, I wonder whether, uh, whether the countries uh, in the region uh, how they view that, um, and, and whether any of um, any of us or any of them have an under an sufficient understanding of the technological challenges of picking which uh, domains to, to try to decouple for strategic reasons. You know, are, are are we at the right place in that uh, in that question? Uh, look, I can have a go at that first if you like. I. Uh I think COVID was a bit of a wake-up call for everybody, and the point that I made about globalisation prioritising efficiency over effectiveness is something we came to see. Um, you know, Australia has a two-way um, reliance, if you like, on China. So a lot of most of our exports, you know, China is our largest trading partner. It's not our largest economic partner, but it is our largest trading partner. Um, a lot of that is raw materials, foodstuffs, and the like. But we also, like all of us, import a lot of things from China. So there's no, absolutely no interest in having uh, a conflict that's going to disrupt that. But I think COVID uh, has probably drawn the light on just how fragile our supply chains are. And we've been able to do that for the last, you know, live with that fragility for the last 20 or 30 years, as I said, largely underpinned by the US Navy, really. Um, but as we can see that being challenged, you know, countries will have to make serious decisions about what they want to produce domestically. Um, you know, microchips, uh, semiconductors and the like are one thing. Australia's got some world-leading radar technologies that, you know, that we've focused on. There's a number of key defence-related aspects that we've, uh, we've deliberately chosen to make sovereign, um, and that's been a conscious decision that started well before COVID, but I think the, uh, the COVID pandemic has probably caused a rethink for most countries on what's the price pe premium you are willing to pay to rebuild the domestic industry. Um, yeah, a good example, I don't know how it'll play out in Australia, but uh, we have had a car industry ever since European, well, since cars were around. Um, that's about to cease um, through economics, largely. Um, so we won't, have, we won't have the ability to produce cars in Australia anymore. So we haven't had that discussion yet that I'm aware of in the government, but maybe we will and say, well, actually, is that something we want to invest in? Historically, the car industry in Australia was subsidised to an extent by the government, and, uh, and that's where the government pulled the subsidy. It's no longer economically viable. So the major car manufacturers are in the process of pulling out. So yeah, we will need to rethink some of those decisions. The other, other uh, area, nothing to do with the Navy, but uh, medicines. You know, we are quite reliant on a lot of drugs and medicines uh, as well. Uh, and we are building um, a vaccination production plant in Melbourne um, to try and get some more sovereign capability around uh, the production of drugs that we need going forward as well. So just a number of examples there, but I think it's an issue all countries have to face. Actually, like you've covered it really well, so I'll just have to, you know, speak on two parts. Not all the countries are happy with the decoupling, but at the same time, it's also an opportunity for a lot of countries. So, you know, the problem is if you do it at a snap of a moment, there will be disruption. And these countries are already finding it difficult to manage these disruptions because they're facing it at every level. So when it comes to technologies, it's just another additional problem. But at the same time, I feel, if you look at, say, just the semiconductor industry, right? China has been dominant so, for so many years. But at the same time, there are so many other countries, whether it's Australia or whether it's India or even Canada, they always had the potential. But of course, the domestic industries got ruined because of, you know, so many years of uh, neglect. 
But at the same time, you know, once you decouple, there, are, there is opportunity for so many other countries to kind of fill that gap. And that is going to help them domestically. So I feel that, OK, it may be a temporary disruption, which may not be liked by a lot of countries. But at the same time, the same countries who have a problem with that disruption can fill those vacuums. And I think that is exactly what they should be doing. And that is exactly wherein you'll have a more, uh, uh, not a US-centric or a West-centric world order, but an anti sinocentric world order. Because if these things do not happen, then it's just between the US or China which is where all these other countries need to come in and kind of support the ongoing international order. And Dr. Peterson? Those are brilliant remarks. I, I really appreciate those. This is not an area of expertise of mine, but I will try to bring it back to an area of, an area of my expertise, which is uh, uh, Russian food exports. So we know that there uh, was and is a global food crisis initiated uh, by the Ukraine war and Russia's uh, uh, blockade of uh, Ukrainian uh, wheat and other, and other agricultural products. Um, but what's interesting about that is that um, prices, what they spiked initially when, when the conflict began um, to record highs, and then they came back down to pre-war highs as the global market adjusted to, to pre-war levels as the global market adjusted to that. Um, that's not to say that prices weren't already high, they already were, but the market found a way to bring those prices back down. So um, countries were able to refill their grain stores and purchase adequate stocks of grain um, from con other countries like Argentina and Australia. Those are the two became the two largest uh, grain exporters in the midst of the global food crisis. So um, Dr. Malhotra makes an, extra an extraordinarily important point and that is that other countries um, can seize opportunities here. That I, I, this is, uh, it may sound strange, but the market sort of finds a way. Um, now, in the long term, it, this may not be sustainable. That's the one thing that's got me concerned. Um, it, over the over the long haul, this may not be sustainable if if prices remain high. Uh, rich rich nations will be fine, but uh, poorer nations uh, and nations that are already food insecure uh, will, will will really really struggle. But in the end, that the, the blow of that global food crisis was really cushioned by other countries stepping in and being able to um, sell uh, uh, grain on the world market uh, to, to countries that needed it. So, so I think the, the, the market was able to correct itself. Thanks. That's, that's such a, a great point. It takes us back to the invisible hand, the whole Adam Smith piece. And, uh, you know, and such a, a positive note, I, I feel we, we must end on such a positive note. And not to mention, it's a great segue to lunch, of course. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about food and we'll go to lunch. Hey, I just on, on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank the three panelists for a really stimulating conversation today about a really important uh, subject that, uh, that we're really starting to get after. And so I appreciate all of you being here today. Thanks so much.